Uh, okay, welcome back. Uh, looks like the vacation hasn't ended yet. Uh, so, any questions? I hope you had a chance to revise at least once. Yeah. So, uh, so let me then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it will be one word. You can assume one word. Maybe I'll send up in the case. Okay. Uh, how about the first question? Was it fine? Okay, cool. okay. So so let's get going. Uh, so we were discussing uh, obviously the benefits of um, biasing our transistors with constant current and then make circuits along uh, once we once we are able to bias it and we uh, and and we saw that there are essentially four ways of by doing achieving that right four architectural ways of achieving that as in you can feed current into the drain observe uh, i mean observe the drain voltage and feed back the information into the gate you can feed current into the drain and tweak the source somehow we haven't seen how Similarly, you can uh, take current out of source, and as it turns out, the transistor auto biases, right? And the final one would be if you if you feed current out of the source and then do something at the gate. So these are essentially four ways of uh, uh, four ways of biasing. So we discussed two before the break. Let's start off and discuss the, other, the others uh, right now. Okay, so. Uh, So the one that we were discussing, let's start off from there. So this was essentially the trivial way of biasing our transistor with a constant current source. And this auto biases itself simply because we saw that there is a there is an in, in, inbuilt uh, feedback mechanism that goes on uh, when you pull current out of the source. And what essentially it does is, if you assume that there is a small capacitance here, for the sake of understanding, uh, what essentially it does is, if if you if you are trying to pull out more current, then the source voltage drops. Since the source voltage drops, which means that we are automatically sending the signal to the transistor that hey, you need to supply more current, and that is exactly what is supposed to uh, what is supposed to happen, right? And hence uh, the transistor auto biases itself. Now, then we said that, hey, how do I make this current source? Uh, we know that a current source is something which has infinite output impedance and a transistor looking into the drain, a transistor biased in saturation looking into the drain has very large output impedance. And if we bias it in saturation somehow, right? If we bias it in saturation somehow, then, then M2 will be, uh, M2 will be, uh, will act as a current source right so so again what is the impedance looking down if m2 is in saturation what is the impedance looking down looking into the drain of m2 if m2 is in saturation yes it's infinite right looking up is 1 over gm looking down is infinite we had a we were trying to replace the current source in so we replace the current source with m2 so ideally if i mean we, it should be it should make sense that we should be able to, we should use that part of the transistor, which gives you some current, but with infinite incremental resistance. And drain happens to be that, that terminal. Okay, so far so good. This is where we stop. So let me uh, take this a step forward before we move on to the uh, other ways of biasing. So now uh, let's assume I, uh, I want this current of I naught, yes. Okay, so his question. Right, right. That's a very good question. So let me spend a minute on that as well. So his question is, uh, what is the intuition behind uh, a transistor impedance being different when I'm looking into the drain and I'm looking into the source? As it turns out, looking into the source is one over GM. Well, from the calculations or the I mean, exam problems that you have done, GMs are of the order of one millisiemens, two millisiemens, which means one over GM is what one k five hundred ohms. But on on the other hand, 
uh, looking into the drain, we are saying it's an infinite impedance, right? What is the intuition behind that? So there are two ways of, uh, uh, of uh, going about it. One obviously is drawing the small signal model and then check as it turns out. The other one is if you go back to the transistor uh, in the charge, uh, the charge uh, picture of a transistor bias in saturation, what essentially happens is this way. Right? So this is a PMOS, which has a gate oxide. On top of that, you have a metal layer and you have drains, basically implants of N here. And uh, if you assume this to be grounded and this to be grounded, and you have, let's say a battery connected. In saturation, what happens is essentially this, right? So your charge in the channel has this profile, correct? So, and if you zoom in here, if you zoom in very close to this, uh, to this drain channel interface, so this is the drain source. If you zoom into the drain channel interface, the gate also has to be connected, right? Otherwise, it won't make any sense. So, yes. uh, if, if you zoom into that interface, what we'll see, this essentially devoid of any mobile electrons, right? So the part, the, the only reason we are getting current is because there is an inherent electric field and whatever these, whenever these mobile carriers find their way close to the interface, they get sucked in by the existing electric field. Now the question is, in, incrementally what happens if I change this voltage, right? From If I go from VDD to VDD plus delta V, let's say, right? VDD plus 10 millivolt or something, would you comment intuitively what's going to happen at that pinch of region? So first thing is, will it change the channel charge? It cannot change charge, right? So it will not change the channel charge. It will just maybe make, make this pinch of region slightly move to the left, right? So essentially what you are seeing is uh, there is little effect to the channel charge if you wiggle the drain voltage. But now move on to the source side and say that I wiggle the source voltage. What can happen? If I wiggle the source voltage, can I influence the channel charge? I can, right? Because there is, so essentially if I increase the source voltage, I am yank, I am essentially doing this, right? I am reducing the channel charge if I <coughs> increase in the source voltage. Similarly, if I reduce the source voltage, I'm decreasing the channel, increasing the channel charge. So essentially I have more influence on the channel charge if I take the source and wiggle it than if I Take the drain and wiggle it. You can imagine it's almost like a thread which is tethered to one, one, one corner and the other corner you are able to move, right? So you cannot move this. Since you cannot move this, you cannot influence in terms of channel, in terms of current. If, if you cannot influence the charge, you cannot influence current. But on the source side, you can influence the charge. Hence, you can influence the current. So in electrical parlance, that current turns out to be, if you change in voltage, you're influencing current, means you have low impedance. But on the other hand, if you change voltage and you are not able to influence the current, it means you have high, high impedance, right? So that's what is happening, okay? And the rest is details, like why is it one over GM and so on, that turns out of the net. Okay. Uh, uh, so now uh, going back to this. So I require, in order to ensure that M2 is in saturation and M2 is at least on, uh, while, uh, since I want to push in current I0 through M2, I need to generate some voltage VGS2, right? Because VGS2 is the cause, right? VGS2 is the cause and I0 is the effect. And we saw that biasing uh, your transistor like this is not particularly good because there can be threshold voltage change, the current will change, right? So for example, uh, so again, uh, just for my satisfaction, indulge me. What happens if, uh, if the threshold voltage of M2 changes? Let's say threshold voltage of M2 decreases. What will happen to this circuit? Current will increase and all the other parameters will naturally change, right? Your GMs will change and so on. 
So what happens if there's a threshold voltage change in M1? <laughs> Right, exactly, right, great. So current will remain same because current is getting set by M2. So now obviously when I'm trying to set the current through M2, I have to ensure that the current through M2 is stable in the sense that it doesn't change with respect to process voltage temperature variations, right? So in, with, 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 change, uh, with the change of ambient conditions, I not shouldn't change. So then we saw that this way of biasing is not particularly good because special voltage if changes, I not will change. Right now, we assume that I have given you a constant I naught. Okay, so threshold voltage is a function. Of, I, again, I haven't thought of, uh, talked about this, but threshold voltage is a function of temperature. Right. So, for example, I mean, in in, in this uh, in this transistor itself, uh, in this picture, how we, how are you getting the bias channel charge? Is essentially because you have certain voltage on on top of. Uh, uh, if you give zero voltage, you don't have any channel charge. And then if you keep on increasing voltage, what happens is the thermal recombination, thermal thermally generated carriers, dispersed, and all those things happen, right? So moment you get into thermal effects, obviously it's a uh, function of temperature also. Since it's a function of temperature, it, uh, I mean, we, one can argue that it will change. How it will change, again, is a matter of detail, but it will change. The other thing is, uh, even if it, uh, if, uh, even if you are not convinced that threshold voltage might change, as it turns out when you are uh, due to temperature, as it turns out when you are making a transistor, you make millions and billions of them on a wafer, right? So you have one, one wafer has, I mean, for example, your the latest iPhone has 12 billion transistors or 10 billion or something. So when you make, make those transistors, so you are making an assumption while I'm doing hand calculation is that if one transistor has threshold voltage of say 0.5 volt, the neighboring transistor also has a threshold voltage of 0.5 volt. That is, they're identical geometrically and everything. While it turns out that is a first order assumption that they're identical, but nominally they're identical, but in reality they are not, right? No two things will be exactly identical. There will always be some mismatch between the characteristics. So you, you target something and you shoot for it, but you cannot ever guarantee that you'll be accurate in any decimal point. There will be some deviation. Right. So these are some of the practical issues that come in, and you always have missing. Yes. Might not, right? If I not slightly increases, let it increase. But why should it? Why, why are you concluding that it will go into linear? Correct. Okay, let's let's see. So let's assume the threshold voltage was one volt. BTH was one volt, while current was one milliamp. Then threshold voltage decreased by hundred millivolt. Let's see. Right. So the current will increase. Current so will increase by some delta i. Correct. Right. So now if current increases by delta r, assuming everything in saturation, right? Because all, everything we are uh, till now in that mode. Uh, then what is happening? We, are, we need to increase. I mean, this this VGS will automatically increase. Right. You are trying to push in more current or suck out more current of the transistor. Right. So let's assume this was three volt. Initially, let's assume this is one volt. So if I if I increase the current, this one volt will decrease by some delta Vs, right? So now if this, if M2 is biased at the edge of saturation, then it will go. But a good design is that you never bias at the edge, right? So you will bias slightly away from the edge. If you can, if you can do that, then M2 did not necessarily be going into trial, right? Okay, yes. <laughs> It might change, yes, it might or might not, but it, if even if you assume that it has changed, then that change in VTH will, you can tell me what, what's going to happen if the VTH of M1 also changed. Exactly, right? So his, his, his uh, argument is if VTH changes, of, I mean, let's assume that the M, VTH of M2 changed due to thermal effects, then M1 and M2 are close by, VTH of M M1 should also change by thermal, due to thermal effects. So the VTH of if M1 changes by, let's say, similarly minus 100 millivolt, right? So one can argue that this, uh, I mean, the source voltage need not have moved 
right? Because by, by the simple change of DTH, I am able to manage, right? So now that becomes a method of detail, right? Should it move, should it not? Then you have to do the calculation and figure out, right? Whether it is necessary for, uh, for source voltage to move or not, okay? Correct. Right. So in any stack, you have to, I mean, whenever you have a stack, we have multiple transistors, you have to figure out whether which which transistor is setting the current. Right. Because there will be one transistor which always sets the current in a well designed uh, circuit because ultimately we are trying to keep the current constant. Right. Okay. Great. So now, uh, uh, so there is another thing that uh, you sh uh, that uh, I should mention before I go to the next step is the fact that just like you have one voltage source from which you derive everything, right? When you are doing your experiments, also you have one fixed voltage source from which you pull multiple wires and connect here and there and decide if if you require a higher, lower voltage than that and so on and so forth. Similarly, you will be given generally you will be given one current source. Right, and from there, from current source or thing, from there you'll have to derive or extract uh, currents or other current sources. Just like from one voltage source, you are yeah, you are plugging out different voltage points. Similarly, from one current source, you need to uh, figure out how to distribute the current in different stacks. Right, so you can assume that there is a current source that is available. And let's say, just like in voltage source, you have access to one terminal. In current source, let's assume you have access to one terminal. I am not talk, um, I have not talked about how you have made the current source, but let's assume that you have the current source which is given to you, which is fixed current source, just like a battery. This is given to you. So now the question is, uh, just like in a voltage source, or just like when you are trying to bias a transistor using voltage sources, you don't put a battery, right? You have some some way of you uh, you have some way of replicating the bias. You just don't put a battery every time. So how do I ensure that this current source, let's assume this gives me I naught, how do I ensure that this current source is able to, uh, uh, I can use this current source to realize this. In the sense, in the context that this um, constant voltage biasing of M2 is not particularly a good idea. Let me repeat what I am trying to say. So as long as you agree that this constant voltage biasing has some problems, the one that we talked about right now, that it's, it's not able to fix the current, right? If things change, if the if, uh, if special voltage of M2 change, the current changes. And we talked about uh, this before the, uh, before the break that biasing a transistor with constant VGS is not particularly a good thing. And that's why we are doing all these things. But it looks like we are, uh, in order to bias M1 with a constant current source or constant current sink, we ended up replacing the constant current source with M2, but M2 has the same old problem, right? So M2 is very sensitive to special voltage change. So what is the solution, right? So what I'm asking is this. So how can I generate this VGS2 so that, uh, how can I generate VGS2 so that I not doesn't change if the threshold voltage or the characteristics of M2 changes. Yes. No, no, we want to bias with a constant current, but let's assume that we don't have one, one current source associated with each transistor. Right? You, just like you don't have one battery associated with each transistor, you have a single battery from, from which you derive everything, right? If you require a lower voltage, you put some register divider and tap out voltages. Similarly, uh, you'll be given one current source and you have to reuse it in, you have to extract information out of it and reuse it in whatever ways you can, right? Similarly, you have one master current source. So if you have like in, I mean, 10 of these circuits, you cannot be expecting to use 10, 10 current sources, right? So you have one current source and you want to use this architecture, which means I am essentially asking is, how do I generate this VGS2 so that, it uh, the current I naught through M2 doesn't change. I can current drain to get of what? I can current drain to get of M2. Okay, so can you walk us through the thought process? Great, it will be in saturation, fine. But is that the only constraint? What is the other constraint of a current source? 
Yes, right. So he, 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 your uh, argument is this. So if I do this, right? So this is what you are suggesting, right? So if I do this, sure, this is in saturation. M2 is in saturation, but the impedance, what is the impedance looking down? It's not infinite anymore, right? It's in fact one over GM, right? So, so this is not a feasible solution. And more importantly, can you comment on the, uh, on the current now on ID through this stack? The current is not fixed, isn't it? Do you see that the current is not fixed? You cannot look into the circuit and tell me what is the current. So now it is, yes. Right. It is looking... Yeah. So now uh, the current is the current is supposed to be set by the VGS two of M two. Now VGS two of M two is essentially the VDS of M two. This node voltage is also getting affected by if you change the gate voltage of M one. Right. <laughs> You know, you, you can do the math and find out, but it's not a very stable way of biasing, right? So in the sense that the current through it is not constant, definitely not constant across uh, if temperature changes, threshold voltage changes, that is one problem. The other bigger problem is that M2 is no longer a current source here, right? So you'll not be able to definitely hold up. The whole purpose was biasing M1 with a current source, but if you direct connect M2, M2 is no longer a current source. There is no math that you have to factor the BS. Suppose I point the green dot to BS. Right. Then what can, then no, you, you equate the current of M1 and M2, right? <laughs> you equate the current of M1 and M2. You will find a voltage. Right? Correct. Yes, you are right. Uh, M2 has an adjusting nature, but it cannot. you cannot comment on what I not is M2. What M2 will do, it will adjust, uh, it will adjust the voltage in order to keep itself happy. Right. That's all. Right. Sir, yes. So, so, what do we want? Is... so we want to ensure that M2 is a current source. And we don't want uh, okay. Firstly, we want M2 as a current source, and the current source should should be stable. So in this we can connect the VGS to source by and between them some voltage source. Okay, so let's see what you're saying. VGS. Okay. Up to VGS. Uh, VG is connected to. Can you call? Okay, let me mark. Let's say this is node one. Uh, this is VS. This is VG2. Now tell me, what should I do? VG2 connected to some voltage source. VG2 connected to some voltage source. This one should connect to a Which one? H2. This one? Yes. This? This is what? And grounded. Okay. Okay. So now, okay. So this is an interesting uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, he, so why don't you walk us through the thought process? Then I'll comment. Why do you want to do this? Now VG2 is fixed. VG2 is fixed, yes. So our DVS to Okay. To currently. Okay. So anybody else want to comment on, on this particular architecture? Yes. Yeah, okay. So even if you're going there, why why do you think this is a problem? This particular architecture? Yeah, right. So now what is the voltage on what is the exact voltage of VS? If this is like VDC, what is the voltage on VS? This is VDC then, right? So this becomes incremental short, right? We want incremental open. Yes. We can keep VG2. So you don't want this, okay? We can keep a battery at the gate and put a resistor at the source. Okay. Why do you, okay, so now this is interesting. Why do you want to do this? What is the thought process? Okay, in case of M2, VGS will be smaller. So why is this a better, why is this a better solution? 
Ah, okay. So his his argument is this. Uh, uh, so okay, let me uh, let me probe you a bit further on this, right? So what you are essentially saying is this contraption looks like a this entire contraption looks like a current source, right? So why does it look like a current source? Because I mean, obviously, I'm looking into the drain. In, 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 impedance is very high. But what about the uh, stability of the current? PGS will be much smaller and okay, yeah. So, in fact, he's right. So, I was not uh, planning to come up with this architecture, but since he has, let me comment on this. So, uh, so we were essentially trying to replace this I naught, right? So when we said that the incremental impedance of this is very high, I one could as well argue that I can replace this with a resistance, right? Whose value tends to infinity, right? It's a current source. I mean, it's a, a resistance whose value tends to infinity is almost like an ideal current source in terms of impedance, right? But what about the uh, what about the current that is Getting drawn. Pardon? Yeah, current will be very small. Correct. So, so now the I mean, why? Why? Okay, again, why do you say current will be very small? Not incrementally. Absolute value of the current. How do you decide on the absolute value of the current from this architecture? VGS automatically reduce, no, not necessarily, right? So let's assume, I mean, if I give you this network, how will you analyze this? You will essentially find, assume some voltage VS here and, and adjust the, and equate the current through the transistor with the current uh, through the resistor and find out a value. So if R is very, if, so now in the incremental sense, firstly, let's do the incremental sense. In the incremental sense, do you agree this is a good current source? Because, Impedance looking down is very high, right? Now the question is, in the absolute sense, whether it's a good current source or not, right? In the sense that whether I whether I'll be able to sustain sufficient amount of current using this architecture. So the problem here is exactly what you said. Let's assume I have one milliamp current, right? This is that's what we started off with. And if R tends to very large value, right? If R tends to very large value, then this voltage will will go up, right? Which means in order to keep the transistor on, I have to increase this voltage to a very large value. So this can be a good current source if you have very average, if you have a lot of voltage headroom available, right? So you can increase the voltage by long, I mean, uh, by really large values, then you can do that. In fact, this is one of the uh, popularly used current source architectures if you are doing design on a breadboard where. Uh, I mean, so one, one problem when you're design, doing design in breadboard is the wiring becomes messy. So you cannot use multi, multiple transistors. So a transistor has like three, four terminals coming out and uh, the, the, the value of economic value of each transistor is higher than the economic value of one resistor in a breadboard, in discrete components. So you, if you want to design something low cost and you are not particularly bothered about how with, whether uh, the breadboard is of this size or slightly bigger, then you can use these type of architectures because, uh, I mean, you will end up spending less if you have more resistors than have more transistors. But in, in, in an IC, uh, simply because you can pack in millions and millions of transistors, the cost, incremental cost of one transistor is very small, right? So you need not do this, particularly in, uh, under the context that it requires very high supply voltages, okay? Okay, good. Uh, so now let's assume that this is not what we are trying to do. So what are the other solutions? So essentially what I'm getting at is I need a, I need a VG2, right? I need a VG2 which can supply I not, 2M2. 
right? So essentially, I am trying to figure out what VG2 should be threshold voltage plus 2I naught by I am I, I'm trying to manufacture this voltage VG2. I need to manufacture this voltage VG2 such that even if threshold voltage changes, I naught doesn't change. So have you seen any circuit till now which does this? And assume that you can use more transistors. So this equation is pointing to the fact that I naught is a independent variable and VG2 is a dependent variable. I'm trying to manufacture VG2 from I naught. So what can I do? I need to make a current dependent voltage. I, I need to obviously make some voltage source with current dependent. You are right, right? So have you seen any such thing where I use a constant current source and get a voltage which changes itself to keep current constant? So have you seen any circuit which I can use which if I feed in current, right? No, not Zina. We are not getting to Zina. MOSFETs. Yeah, the first one, correct, right? So, for example, if you, uh, we want to do everything with MOSFETs, right? So, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, Zina actually is 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 a very good idea. People use Zina, but the issue with Zina is. Uh, uh, is is that cut on cutting the cutting voltage for Zener is also not particularly fixed. It changes with temperature, right? So so uh, so 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 as he pointed out, the first circuit that we had done, right? So what is this essentially telling you? This this equation is implying that I am keeping VG two minus VTH constant, right? If I have a constant current source. I'm keeping the overdrive of the transistor constant while I am feeding I naught somehow. Correct? So the first, I let me take you back to the first network, right? So if you if you have a transistor and you feed in current into the drain, how were how what was the basic way of biasing this? Right, right, but that is not a very good one. Then what was the stable, more stable way? Correct. So you make a diode connected. If you diode connect, what is this voltage? Vg will be equal to special voltage plus. No, no, we are assuming we have current sources, right? We start, I said that you, you will be given one current source, right? One current source is given to you, then you have to use it somehow. So as it turns out now, if you have one current source, you have to generate this voltage VG2, as he pointed out that looks like we need to generate a voltage which is dependent on a current source. So how do I generate that voltage which is dependent on a current source, right? So that we have already done in the past. When current source is generally given, but as it turns out, you can make good current sources in an IC also, but we'll not get into that. But assume that a current source is given. Like you will be in generally when you be at least in the lab setup, you can be you can use one of the current sources. Right? For example, I think here uh, I don't know which equipment say you use in TSC two zero one, but uh, the bench setup that you use, uh, the source can some of the sources can be configured as a current source or a voltage source. You can sometimes see it gives fixed one amp current or fixed 100 milliamp current. So that's a current source. Okay, so do you agree that this is a solution? I mean, I can generate that magic voltage that I'm looking at by doing this. <coughs> 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 
right ah, okay i mean you have I, i'm giving telling you that one current source is given then we'll see how can how we can use this multiple times but let's assume that this is the this is what it is do you agree that this vg that we have generated right now is good enough right so if that is the case all, all we have to do is i mean let me sketch it back We are looking for this VGS. We were looking for this VGS, which is supposed to be this. And this I am gen I can generate from here. So all I can do is, if the current source is given, I can generate my voltage and con connect these two nodes, right? So this is M3. Okay. So will this work? Yeah, because I mean, one of the reasons it will work is obviously because this current entirely flows into M3 and nothing goes here, right? This current is zero. Which means that even if I have connected these two as I have shown, there won't, there won't be any current diversion. This voltage will be exactly equal to VG2 will be a VGS. Two or rather VG yeah. in this case, VGS two will be special voltage plus now if special voltage changes, right? If special voltage changes by let's say 100 millivolts, the overdrive remains constant because the VGS two also changes, right? If special voltage increases, this also increases. Thereby overdrive remains constant, thereby I naught remains constant. Note that this is under the assumption that the characteristics of M2 and M3 are identical. Right? If the threshold voltage of one changes, the other doesn't change, then this will not be a very stable way of biasing. So that is why in IC design, what we generally tend to do is uh, when you have to ensure that this M2 and M3 are as physically close to each other as possible. So that if something changes on M2, you can be rest assured that the equivalent thing changes in M3 also. One of the other reasons is ultimately you will be making these transistors on a sheet of P-type silicon. So if you put, I mean, and, and there, as it turns out, even though we assume that the P-type silicon has certain doping concentration, which means certain type of certain amount of mobility, but as it turns out across the wafer, the, everything changes. There is a gradient of this doping, there is a gradient of this mobility, and so on and so forth. So, but these gradients are very shallow in the sense that as long as you don't put one transistor at one corner of the wafer, the other at the other corner, you won't see too much of a difference. But if, as an IT designer, you have to ensure that this too much of a difference is not a very, uh, 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 not a very assuring um, uh, gesture. All you have to do is to ensure that M2 and M3 are, neighbor, are neighboring transistors. They are placed in such a way that that is absolutely, I mean, you cannot bring them any more closer. Uh, yeah, so again, we, I, I'll tell you, I am giving, telling you that you have one current source available. You have one current source will be given to you, just like you have one voltage source that is given to you. Yes, so yeah, so yeah, so I'm not I'm not getting into how you have built this master current source. That is, let's assume that is given. So now, how do you use this master current source to feed multiple transistors with constant current source? Uh, okay, so in this single transistor circuit, yes, you could, but let's assume you you want ten of these, right? So let's assume I have another. Let's assume I have uh, this. This was I not equal to one milliamp. Let's say this is one milliamp. Let's say I have another network, right? Another identical network, which requires one milliamp. And you have the same master current source. Now you have to use it to feed both of them. So what will you do? Yeah, so the question is, let, let's assume you have another, another two sets of transistors, like M5, M6. And this also requires one milliamp to be uh, to be flowing through it using a constant. Uh, it the, the current has to be constant, right, across temperature variation and so on. 
but you have only one current source that you have used up here. So is there a, right, exactly, right? I can simply connect these two. And you can keep on doing this for n number of contractions. Yeah, in this case, the assumption is W by L of both M, M3, M2, M6 are identical, right? So now let's assume, I'm taking that Q, let's assume I want this to be 2 milliamps. I want to multi this current to be twice. So what should I do? Let's assume this is W by L, this is W by L to start off. I want 2 milliamp current in this branch, uh, the right-hand side branch through M6. What can I do? Double W by L, right? So if I simply double W by L, I'll get double the current, isn't it? So I can simply do two times this. I keep the VGSM, I increase W by L because current in the transistor is proportional to W by L. I can simply scale W by L. Uh, and if you're not comfortable in the equation format, you can assume I can use two of these contractions. Each of W by L. And connect them in parallel, right? And this obviously are same voltages. So this entire stuff that you see is uh, is a contraption of twice the size, right? Each transistor is twice W by L. Each transistor is twice W by L, and we, hence you will get double the current, right? You can assume that these two transistors are single transistor uh, clubbed parallelly. Yes. Ah, okay, okay. So the you mean this one, this one, right? Ah, okay. So uh, if so, essentially, what I am trying to do is uh, I am saying that I want, in terms of biasing, this is not necessary, right? You have you have equal current, right? One milliamp current flowing here, one milliamp current flowing here. It's fine. But let's assume that I want this M five or an M five A to be uh, uh, to behave like a single transistor. Of double the size. So then I have to ensure that the sources are also connected together, right? Other than if I don't connect the sources, I cannot assume that they are a single transistor of double the size. Yeah, no, no, no. That is part of the problem, but that's not whole, not, not the whole problem, right? So current sources. So okay. When you say current sources don't exist in real life, are you comfortable that voltage sources exist in real life? Right. So you make voltage sources using lead and all lithium ion batteries and so on, right? So similarly, you can make current sources also. They exist. You can make, right? Fundamentally, it's not different, right? Ultimately, you are pulling out some charge from somewhere. So you can make current sources using uh, external stuff. But on chip, you can also make current sources using MOSFETs. Again, not a part of this course, we'll not get into that, but you can. So there are some things called, later on, if you take more courses, you will see that we can in fact make very good voltage references on chip also, which are called band gap references and so on. So from there, you can extract some voltage, pass it through some node and all those things you can do to get uh, good current sources, decent current sources, and people do that. I mean, if it's not possible, then none of your cell phones will work. So, uh, so okay, so, so coming back to this point, that uh, given that you have one current source, you should be, now you have a way of ensuring that you can reuse that current source multiple times to bias whatever you want, You assuming that you want a constant current source bias. And what is the, what is the uh, underlying principle? The underlying principle is that if you have uh, one, if you, if you feed in current source into a diode connected transistor, the voltage VGS2 that you are generating is, is, uh, is auto adjusted in order to keep the current constant. So now that essentially is the magic voltage that you are looking for. So you can feed this voltage to, to across VGS2 of n number of transistors, assuming they are in saturation, their current will also be equal to I0 irrespective of change of temperature. So which means that I can have circuits attached to this, I can have separate circuits attached to this, and I can keep on doing this, 
and I have a solution which I can use to feed in current. I have a solution where I can use MOSFETs to replicate current from one current source to all the branches that we want. Uh, yes. Okay, so so do uh, okay. So you you mean that you didn't understand when I put things in parallel or when I simply increase the W by L? Device size will change, but not necessarily the characteristics. But go on. Ah, okay, right. So yeah. So his question is: If I am when I am changing W when I am doubling a transistor size, I am assuming that the VTH hasn't changed. If it can as well be that I have changed the transistor size, so, so the threshold voltage might have changed. And which is a fair enough assumption, right? Correct. So which means that you, yeah, yeah. So very good question. As it turns out, if you don't keep the transistors identical, you cannot guarantee their VTHs are same. So that, that's a real life problem. So that's why this is the alternate solution. You keep the transistors identical and use multiple of them in parallel. Huh, okay, so so he, he, his question is uh, this, right? So, so forget about the current sources and all, right? So if you just assume this, let's assume you have generated this voltage VGS2. How you have generated is a, is a different issue. And you have current of I naught equal to one milliamp. Okay. And it has a threshold voltage of one volt, mu and C of same, and so on. I want uh, I want another case where I would want to reuse this VGS2 and get two milliamp. Right? So uh, my equation is telling me I naught is proportional to W by L. All I can do if this is W by L, I, I, all I can do is I can make this twice W by L. Double the size, connect these two, I'll get two milliamps. But as it pointed out correctly, that why should we assume that a, diff, a transistor which is wider, double the, of having double the weight should have the same threshold voltage? Need not necessarily be, which is a practical problem. So what we then say is, we'll do this, We'll use the transistor of identical aspect ratio, that is identical W by L, everything same, twins. And I'll feed this voltage here also. Then I can be rest assured that this will be one milliamp, this will be one milliamp, to a fair amount of accuracy. But it's still not two milliamps to a one transistor. So what can I do? I can connect these two. And if I take this, observe this voltage, this current, this will be two milliamps. Correct. And then I say that this contraption looking in is for all practical purposes equal to one transistor of double the size. Right? This is nothing but putting two resistors in parallel, right? If, if you put two resistors in parallel there and you keep the voltage constant, uh, two identical resistors in parallel, their current doubles, the total current doubles. Right. The, the same thing, same thing over here. You can, there are some cases where you want to do that, but in most cases you don't because you don't want to tamper the master source. So you, you, you have an option of replicating current. So you generally tend to use this. Uh, one piece of jargon is this is, uh, instead of replicating in, in, in circuit design parlance, we call it mirroring. So you're mirroring current from one branch to another. So these type of uh, mirroring techniques are called current mirrors. Right, so we are mirroring current from one branch to another. So these are current mirrors, extremely vital uh, piece of uh, architecture, which we'll discuss in detail going forward. There are some nuances to it which you need to know. But assuming this uh, this discussion as of now, we'll we'll stop here and we'll uh, we'll start from here tomorrow. Okay, thank you.